Now, what I find truly remarkable about the conventional wisdom is that it argues what America ought to do and sort of like what America, not necessarily what America can do. It implies that America must eliminate instability, uncertainty, poverty, insurgencies, threats to allies, and essentially the sort of natural patterns of global politics. What they never ask is what is the likelihood of such a disruption uh, in terms of our access to foreign markets? What is the harm if the access to markets is closed and for how long? How we've dealt with such disruptions in the past, which we have? And are there available alternatives if there are certain threats to access to markets or to uh, our allies for that matter? I think what is also really remarkable and truly astonishing about the conventional wisdom is that poverty, uncertainty, and instability are everywhere. As Tom Palmer likes to say, poverty is the natural state of mankind. So to eliminate the inevitable patterns of global politics is an intrinsically Sisyphean task. It's an essentially limitless mission that conventional wisdom argues in Washington. Another astonishing part about uh, the conventional wisdom is how it argues for free trade and free markets while simultaneously contradicting free trade and free market principles. It argues not that the United States should withdraw from the world in order to allow for international transactions and for peaceful economic exchange, but that the government should impose trade and impose order in order for free trade to take place. In some respects, this is a very radical, leftist, and some might say Marxist-Leninist interpretation of US foreign policy. It's this pernicious notion that the United States should use aggressive military force and political intervention to secure the flow of raw materials. It's a very pernicious argument. I think most importantly, and what I'd like to focus on for the remainder of my talk, is what the conventional wisdom advocates. And that is a very warped perception of American exceptionalism. I truly believe that America is exceptional, not only for its history, but also its values and its principles. But what the conventional wisdom argues is that because of our history and because of our principles and values, we have a special role to play in the world. And we must impose our order and coerce others in the process. We can intervene all over the world because we are exceptional. We have the wisdom, the foresight, the sophisticated weaponry, and the capability to reshape foreign societies. It's a very self-loving mission and a notion that the US government is entitled to meddle and reshape foreign societies. And it almost becomes immoral if we don't use our power for good. Now, what the conventional wisdom does is replace what should be an argument about empirical data and outcomes with wishful thinking and hypothetical threats. What it needs is an honest assessment about the success of military intervention and its consequences for democracy. And I think that's what we can judge right here today. So I just want to pivot and start with one case study, Iraq. Now, despite daily bombings, mass casualty car bombings, and ongoing sectarian violence, virtually nobody pays attention to Iraq anymore, which is very sad. Now, certainly, we were uh, sort of led into war for national security imperatives. But again, we were misled. Uh, later on, we find that the government had deceived many Americans. We were essentially duped. And it essentially drew into a mission or devolved into a mission to spread free market principles and de democratic institutions to the Middle East. But over the past year, as we've seen, Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki's government has begun to harass and attempt to silence Iraq's news media and anyone else it considers a critic. The government virtually gave itself unlimited discretion to review the applications of, for the licensing of television satellite trucks censoring books, and controlling internet cafes. Former Prime Minister Iyad Alawi has said that Iraq, quote, is slipping back into the clutches of a dangerous new one-man rule, which inevitably will lead to full dictatorship, unquote. Kurdistan President Masoud Barzani has said, quote, Iraq is facing a serious crisis. It's coming towards one-man rule, unquote. Reuters concluded that Maliki's authoritarian behavior evokes memories of, quote, the laws used to muzzle the media under Saddam Hussein, unquote. And of course, we have the Freedom House's Freedom of the World survey, and says that Iraq is today less oppressive compared to Saddam Hussein, but just barely. From a, it moved from a score of seven in political rights, which was the most oppressive, a score of political rights in, of seven in 2003, up to a score of six in 2010, a one point difference in seven years. Safiya al suhail a women's rights advocate and an Iraqi parliamentarian, argues that the overthrow of Saddam Hussein and the radicalism that was spawned in its wake also led to a severe deterioration in women's safety. The massive social dislocation led many Iraqis to enroll and become enlisted in armed religious factions, sectarian militias, and religious political parties, many of which engaged in fanaticism and aggression directed at women. Even the practice of honor killings, 
increased and intensified after the US-led invasion. In addition, Americans paid an enormous price in blood and treasure to end up with an Iraq that is un under considerable Iranian influence. Now certainly Saddam was a brutal tyrant, but he was also secular, hostile to Islamists, and a foe of Tehran. Maliki and his various Shiite militias that he relies on for political support is less secular and is partnered with Iran's Shiite regime. And just a quote here, uh, in June the Associated Press reported that Iran, quote, helped create, unquote, the Maliki administration in 2010 and is now, quote, calling in favors among its allied factions in Iraq, unquote. The AP also reported that Shiite clerical leader Muqtada al-Sadr had gone to Iran for talks and that Sadr's mentor, Grand Ayatollah Qasim al-Hiri, issued a fatwa against support for secular leaders in the new Iraqi government. Now, Hawks calling for war with Iran as a result of sort of its expansion throughout the region, this sort of illustrates what uh, Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises calls or describes as the cumulative tendency of government intervention, in the sense that government perceives a problem and it intervenes to solve it. But instead of solving the initial problem, the government intervention creates two or three or four further problems. And we see this with the case with Iraq. The removal of Saddam Hussein as the principal strategic candidate to Iran paved the way for the expansion of Iranian influence across the region. And now we see hawks arguing for a war with Iran, even though the invasion and occupation of Iraq was one of the many uh, sort of uh, triggers and catalysts to the expansion of Iranian influence. And this is, of course, why when we account for the investment we've made in terms of the dead and wounded, the time spent and the attention consumed by our leaders, our journalists, and our scholars, again, polls show overwhelmingly that many Americans believe the Iraq war was a mistake. 